I'm, I'm really thrilled to tell you a little bit more about what the FDIC does, and uh, we can certainly get into more of the, the questions and answers during the panel, but just for, for some of you to better describe what, what we do in uh, the, uh, where, what the FDIC San Francisco region entails, we supervise 400 insured financial institutions in the West, and that's, that totals about $2 trillion in, in assets. There are about 5,400 insured banks across the country and 18 trillion in, in total assets nationally. So what, do, what does the FDIC do? We, we insure financial institutions. We also examine uh, the safety and soundness of the institutions and monitor compliance with laws and regulations that are enacted. And, and those laws uh, also include making sure that consumers are protected and there are proper proper disclosures and so forth that are provided to consumers. So we make sure that banks are complying with all the laws and rules and regulations that, that exist. In the West, 93% um, of our banks are rated satisfactory. So banks are in really good condition today. And, uh, and I'm, I certainly hope that that will continue. As far as our compliance area, the consumer protection area, 95% of our banks in the West are rated satisfactory. So we, uh, again, our, our bread and butter really is to uh, oversee the community banks primarily. The OCC covers uh, the, the examination process for national, national banks. But I think uh, the FDIC's focus on community banks is so important. Again, you've got some great community banks here in, in Santa Barbara that I've had the pleasure to work with. Uh, community banks are really the sort of the bread and butter of our economy and uh, they do so much for small business and economic growth. Although in, in our region, we have uh, had a lot of, of banks that have merged, and we are supervising much more uh, larger institutions these days, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as, as I move forward in my presentation. So people often ask me, well, where, where are we exactly in the, in the banking cycle? So I, I sort of joke that, well, we're closer to the end of the peak than we were a year ago, and, and uh, that's about all the, that I can tell you. I don't, I don't have a crystal ball for, for sure. But we have, some, we have seen some metrics that indicate that there's been a little bit of a slowdown, and then other metrics that, that indicate that there's continued growth and, and productivity increases. But, I, we, we certainly began 2019 in a position of strength, and I think the, the Fed having moderated interest rates, and you'll hear probably more about that a little later, uh, that certainly has, has allowed us to continue this position of strength. And, but we still encourage bankers to think of our current economic environment really as sort of a, a, a pre pre-crisis, because this is typically, particularly when we're on the longer end of the, of the cycle, this is typically when some of the, uh, a bad decision can, can be made. Uh, just, just to contrast, in 2017, let's see if I can get this, we felt like we were about right here, um, kind, of, kind of at the expansion and the peak point. So as you can see where the gray bubble is, we, that's sort of where we feel that, that we're at. That's the point in the cycle that we're, we're feeling right now. But that can really change based on the, the market that you're in, the niche that you're, that you're in. So uh, again, we've, we, I've seen both positive and, and negative uh, headwinds. But for the most part, uh, again, conditions are good. It's, it's our mandate to identify risks before they become bigger problems. So, so we're probably uh, going to be more pessimistic than optimistic. So I want you to keep that in mind. But uh, again, long credit cycle. And I think there are some other things that sort of uh, impact this cycle, or this, this map that, 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 uh, that really have developed. We've, we've used this map for a long time. And I have to, have to add that uh, there's, there's sort of a factor which I, I've termed the transformation impact. So, for example, what, what do uh, digital investments, uh, there's, there's so much focus on the a customer experience redesign, how do those things affect the economic cycle? And I think, I think we're seeing that. And, uh, you know, bankers are, are understanding that some of their traditional borrowers don't behave or have the same customer experience needs that they may be used to. And so how does that affect the, the banking cycle? 
Uh, bankers do tell me that they are seeing some loosening of, of credit, and we, we always sort of uh, laugh internally at the FDIC because it's always the bank, the other bank, not their bank, uh, but the other bank that's loosening the credit standards. So just to show you a little bit about the change in the, the number of banks and, and what's happened across the a country, uh, we continue to see the growth in industry assets as, as the number of banks actually has decreased. So since the beginning of 2014, the, the number of institutions decreased about 21% or about 1,400 banks uh, across the country, while the assets actually have increased 22%. So the left side of this chart here shows the decline in the number of banks, primarily banks, as you can see, uh, that these are broken down. The colors are, represent the uh, different size of institutions. So the number of banks have, that have declined are primarily those banks that have total assets less than 500 million. And that decline has occurred through mergers and acquisitions, not through, through failures. In fact, in 2018, we had zero failures at, at the FDIC across the country. So again, a, a very good sign that uh, we've got a positive economy and a, a lot of positives in, in, that, are, that, are, that exist today. On the, on the right side of this chart, it shows that, the, again, the total assets have increased 22% over the last five years. And the majority of that is in the asset bucket where the, the banks are exceed 10 billion in total assets. This, this next chart uh, shows just the San Francisco region. Again, that's the, the 10 Western states, including the Pacific Islands. So we've, we've seen a very similar uh, decline and increase compared to the rest of the nation. Uh, we have uh, we've lost 146 banks in the San Francisco region over the five-year period, but our, our assets have increased over 50% from roughly 1.5 trillion to a little over 2 trillion. So we are certainly managing a lot more assets, but, but fewer, fewer institutions. So while, while banks have declined, like I said, due to uh, merger and acquisition activity during the past five years or so, we are seeing some interest in, in new financial institutions, our de novo activity. The, the blue are the darker shades on this chart. They show that uh, th those are where we have current or pending uh, applications. So uh, it doesn't, there's not a whole lot of, of states that are, that are lit up there. You can see it's primarily on the, on the west coast and the, and the coastal areas. But that, uh, this only highlights those where we've actually approved or, or accepted an application. But I can tell you in the San Francisco region alone, we've probably, I know we've met with over 20 groups in just the last four months. And, and we are seeing uh, proposals that involve fintech, uh, uh, more niche type banks, and then also some traditional community type of banks. So we are seeing a lot of interest out there and uh, I think uh, after meeting with some of the groups, they, they certainly come back and, and some come back and see us again, some don't. I think some realize that this process of, of obtaining deposit insurance and applying for deposit insurance is a, is a, tough, is a tough road. There, there are currently uh, nine pending applications across the, the country. We have two, two in Utah right now. One is uh, Square Bank and one is a Bank of St. George. And so far, the FDIC has approved three, three new institutions in 2019. Our, our chairman, we have a new chairman, Yelena McWilliams, and uh, she has certainly changed the focus a little bit at the FDIC. She's, she, will, she will celebrate her one-year anniversary with the FDIC in June, and uh, she, she definitely has a mandate, some things that she'd like to accomplish during her term as chairman. One of the things is to make sure that that uh, de novo institutions are, are welcome and that we are considering new proposals. We've changed our processes a little bit where we now accept a draft application. We can review a draft proposal. Uh, a draft proposal would be more than just a concept, but a, a proposal that addresses the statutory factors. And then that allows us to provide the uh, applicant some feedback before they actually submit their formal application, which which requires a, a publishing requirement with a, with a formal application. So it's, a, it's been a good avenue for us to give feedback to entities that are contemplating a, a new bank charter. Uh, 
one of, I mentioned FinTech, and that, that is an area where, again, we've seen, we've met with a lot of groups, and I know our Washington office has met with a lot of groups as well that are interested in that, in that space. The, uh, the, the, the main distinction, our chairman said this in a speech recently, and the, the issue is a lot, of, a lot of the FinTech companies are what they call pre-profit. So, you know, all their, their capital has been invested in R&D and they, they, they um, have a much more difficult time proving that they have the capital to, to support a new bank. And clearly, uh, you may have heard this, FDIC is forever demanding increased capital. capital. Uh, they, uh, they, we, we expect the bank to have a minimum amount of capital when, when they open. And it, that minimum amount of capital should support the type of business plan and business model that that bank has uh, or they, that, that they plan for. So uh, a FinTech being pre-profit has a few hurdles to prove the capital that they have in place to, to begin a new bank. Um, I know w Peter will, will get into more of sort of the economics, but I'll, I'll share with you some things that the FDIC reviews. We, we publish what we call a quarterly banking profile. It's out on the FDIC's website if you haven't seen that. Uh, all banks submit a quarterly call report and that is essentially a lot of data on their financial statements, both the balance sheet and income statement and many other things. So we analyze that data and uh, look, at the, look at the trends over, over time. Again, in 2019, we really started in a position of strength uh, net income it has increased and continues to improve. And in fact, in the, the San Francisco region, the return on assets for our, our banks, uh, pre-tax return on assets is 1.52%. Uh, that's the highest it's, it's been uh, since uh, 2007, so 1.52%. And I know we, all, we, we did get a little bit of a benefit from uh, tax reform, but we, we estimated taking out that benefit in 2018, the net income was still up from the prior year by about 13%. Uh, so, so there's still a big, a big uh, trend upward in terms of, of net income. We have observed with that uh, loan growth across all loan types, except for commercial real estate. That is an area that, that we have seen a little bit of a, a slowdown. Although across the, the nation, loan balances have increased 4%, but that's, that's really uh, sl slowed down quite a bit. It's tapered, tapered off. And again, uh, the CRE category, commercial real estate category, is the category that has uh, not seen the same growth. But out here in the West, we have uh, a lot of banks that have very heavily concentrated commercial real estate portfolios. Uh, that is uh, the area where, uh, during the economic recession, unfortunately, a lot of our banks uh, uh, ran into to significant problems in the commercial real estate area, suffered a lot of losses. So we, we certainly talk about uh, being too concentrated and make sure banks are monitoring the, uh, the, the, the specific characteristics of the commercial real estate portfolio and have a good handle on that. And, and while the exposure level has been back up, we have seen banks are doing a good job of, of diversifying within the portfolio and, and monitoring that, that risk. Also, uh, deposit growth is slowing. We've, we've seen some uh, slower growth. There's definitely a lot more competition for, for deposits. And so that is really heated up. There's a lot of, I think, outside sources that are competing for, for deposits. And uh, of course, uh, with, with the increased interest rates, there's a little bit of a higher funding cost for institutions as well. This, this chart uh, breaks down a little bit more of what I was talking about as far as the loan growth. Again, the loan balances continue to increase and our, our median within the San Francisco region, uh, and that's those states that have a, a percentage on, on the chart there, our median increase is 7.8% in the region. Compared to nationally, it's just a little bit over 5%. In California specifically, the, the median loan growth is 9.3%. So uh, again, California seems to always sort of be a, a leader. Uh, I think in many respects here in the West, we were sort of the first one into the economic recession and probably the first one out of the economic recession. And we certainly have rebounded very, very well uh, compared to other parts of the, the country. 
So in, in the West here, every, every state except Wyoming um, exceeds the national median, median in terms of, of loan growth. I mentioned deposit growth is slowing. Uh, a, lot, a lot going on in this chart, but again, the, uh, uh, we've seen that deposit growth has slowed in the region and across the nation. The, the red line here on this chart shows the San Francisco region median uh, deposit growth, so the 50th percentile, and then that shaded area is the, the 25th and the 75th percentile. So you can sort of see the trend over time. And in, uh, it was in 2010, the, whoops, Wrong one. I'm just getting bigger instead of smaller. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, in 2010, I here you can see where the deposit growth actually went um, went negative. So banks lost deposits uh, at that time over overall. Uh, the, the blue, again, the blue shaded area kind of shows that range, but going back to 2010, you'll notice that the banks in the, in the uh, 25th percentile lost deposits, and we've, we've really tracked pretty, pretty closely with the economic recession. So you have to ask, why, why, are, why is the deposit growth slowing? Again, I think the phenomena of, of, of um, you know, different, different deposit-taking methods that are out there, uh, I've, I asked an audience recently how many of them had a Starbucks app, app on their phone and how many people had a, a Venmo app on their phone and how many of you have money parked on both of those uh, apps. It's like a deposit, right? So some of, that deposit is deposit, uh, some of those deposits are, are being placed in other places sort of, sort of unknowingly and, and uh, there are fintech companies. There's one in the Bay Area that I think they said they opened over 2,000 checking accounts in the last year or so, and, and they offer zero fees. So uh, that's really hard to compete with, but it is changing the, the, the landscape at, at uh, our financial institutions. So a little bit more about FinTech. We, we certainly have, have seen a shift a little bit here. Uh, we've seen where I think banks thought for, for a long time that FinTech was going to be a, a big disruptor, and it probably has in some respects. But I also see more recently where uh, larger banks and our smaller community banks are certainly embracing more technology, choosing to partner with some of the tech firms, or maybe even building something in-house rather than viewing FinTech as a competitor. But uh, again, tech has facilitated the growth of digital deposits. We, we see less and less reliance on on the brick and mortar branches or, or the style of a branch is certainly different than it, than it used to be. And I, I think that will probably continue as, as our, uh, our whole national landscape sort of changes with regard to that customer experience that I mentioned earlier. But the, the San Francisco region, we've, we've seen a significant exposure to the tech sector and uh, we're, we're certainly not we're not ignoring the fact that, that you know, there was a dot-com bubble and, and burst uh, years back, so we, we are paying a lot of attention to the concentrations in the tech sector. So this, this chart shows the number of, of, uh, and diversity of the fintech investments or partnerships by the 10 largest banks in the, in the country. Uh, th that loan growth that I referred to earlier, it's kind of interesting because the, the highest levels of, of loan growth that have occurred in the San Francisco region have, has occurred in mainly tech hubs. Uh, not only the Bay Area, Seattle, Provo, Salt Lake, I know some in the uh, Los Angeles area, they, they refer to these as, as Silicon Beach, uh, Silicon Slopes, you know, Silicon uh, Rainforest. You know, there's, there's, it's definitely, definitely expanding a little bit from, from what, we, what we are accustomed to is just the Silicon Valley. So, uh, tech firms actually make up an estimated 20% of office leasing space nationwide. That's double from what it was five years ago. So again, good reason why we are looking at, at tech and, and the headwinds p potentially in, in this area. Uh, we'll probably also watch what happens with some of these IPOs that are out there now with some of the tech firms and see, see what, what the impact is and if the venture capital associated with a lot of the fintechs actually uh, 
uh, remains or s sort of starts to slow down as, as well. Okay, the next topic, probably near and dear to many of you, because I know that this is something that, uh, as businesses, certainly our, our banks are, are, are dealing with. Uh, this is, chart shows the state law when it comes to uh, cannabis. 40, 46 states, and including the District of Columbia, have uh, passed laws that, that legalize marijuana in some form, so recreational or, or medical. The, the dark green areas that are those states and D.C. that uh, have approved recreational use of, of mar marijuana. The light green shows uh, that uh, there's medical uh, marijuana that has been approved. All states, including those that are in gray, are covered by the legislation that was recently um, enacted regarding hemp. So, so it is um, legal, hemp is legal in, in those states. So you can see, I. I I know I've told people this, and in fact, when visiting with a couple of you last night, I really thought that when California passed both uh, recreational and the medical, that, that maybe we would see some uniformity between federal and state law. But uh, for federal purposes, marijuana is still considered a controlled substance. And uh, so that has, has certainly presented some challenges for financial institutions to, to bank that business. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the legislation regarding hemp, which provides a little bit of, of, of leeway, although I'm, I'm a little bit of a skeptic when it comes to this area. I think that, that the, uh, the, the jury is still out if it really does provide some relief to bankers, because unless you're, unless you're back in the back room measuring whether this has 0.3 THC or 0.31 THC, I'm not sure how you, how you do all that. I'm, I've, I've got uh, uh, some plans in place to be further educated on on, the, on hemp and marijuana, and I'm and not by using it either, um, but <laughs> but uh, just to just to better understand how how do banks plan to to manage through this? And, and right now, with regard to hemp, the while the Improvement Act was was put in place, uh, all the states have to still enact all of their uh, controls and submit an approval plan to the USDA, and they're still in process of drafting regulations. So again, it's a lot more to come in this area, but, but perhaps, uh, perhaps this will help institutions, and I won't be a skeptic if, if uh, you ask me this question or we talk about this a year from now. But for now, if a bank does uh, bank any type of a marijuana-related businesses, they, they have to follow some guidance that was issued by the uh, financial, it's called FinCEN, Financial Enforcement Crimes Network, that th they have to follow some guidance that was issued back in 2014 that, that, that outlines a lot of different uh, requirements for a financial institution to follow. And it's not, it's not, it's not an easy task either. It's not, a, it's not an easy lift for financial institutions to, to, uh, to do that. I will uh, tell you a little bit about what, what the FDIC does when we supervise uh, any any business that we consider cash intensive, uh, it really is based on on the risk. And a bank has to decide what level of risk they want to accept if they choose to bank this type of business. And have they must have uh, proper places, proper controls, and monitoring procedures in place to to evaluate that activity. And I can tell you, uh, we do have banks that are banking the, that business. And we, I think there are over 1,000 banks that are filing suspicious activity reports as it relates to that business because it may be something outside of, of what they would normally expect. It may be a, a, a spike in activity or, or it's just in, in order to bank that business, they have to file a suspicious activity report. But I, I want to read one thing to you here, and I think this is really important, and this is from a... Uh, a financial institution letter that the FDIC sent out to all of our, our banks in 2015. And it's a statement on providing banking services in general. And it, it reads, the FDIC encourages institutions to take a risk-based approach in assessing individual customer relationships rather than declining to provide banking services to entire categories of customers without regard to the risk presented by an individual customer or the financial institution's ability to manage the risk. 
financial institutions that can properly manage customer relationships and effectively mitigate the risks are neither prohibited nor discouraged from providing services to any category of customer accounts or individual customers operating in compliance with applicable state and federal laws. So again, I go back to it's a, it's a risk-based approach and a financial institution uh, must and should take a, a risk-based approach to banking that business. And uh, it, it really is a, is a bank decision, but I, we, we acknowledge there's a lot of compliance that has to go on behind the scenes. And um, the, the, in 2018, there was what they called the Cole Memo that, that was rescinded, uh, or it was rescinded prior to that, but in 2018, the FinCEN actually, they sort of reaffirm, reaffirmed that the Cole Memo still, still applies, but uh, the guiding principles apply, but it, but it, but it was rescinded. So it's a, it's, it's a very confusing, complicated area for, for banks to maneuver. And uh, so again, even though banks are banking the business, they're, they're, uh, the activity is still federally illegal. It's a, it's a controlled substance and it presents a lot of, a lot of challenges. Uh, so customer di due diligence expectations. These are, these are just the steps that banks must take to review a new account if they decide to bank this business. Um, again, th a, lot of, a lot of different steps here. I would say one point on this slide, understanding the normal and expected activity for a business, including their products and customers, is probably, that's an area that if, if we were examining the bank, we would, we would look at, well, what's normal for this, this entity? If, if, your, if your cabinet maker is all of a sudden bringing in, you know, tons and tons of cash, why is that? And, and so you have to look at what's normal, and a bank is going to ask you, What's, what's normal or wh where's this from? And, and I think that's the, the, the best way to, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to monitor this is really you know, with, with, with honesty that this is, this is from my customers or, or knowing the source and being able for a bank being able to explain where those funds came from is really important and that keeps them um, out, of, out of trouble and it allows us to analyze their, their Bank Secrecy Act AML program. So I think I will stop there, and I look forward to your questions a little bit later this morning. Again, thank you so much for allowing me to be here in Santa Barbara at this beautiful theater. It's great to be here with you at the UC Santa Barbara Economic Summit. My plan today is to give some prepared remarks about monetary policy, and then I look forward to having a wide-ranging discussion with Peter and Kathy afterwards. But before I begin, let me note that my comments reflect my own views and do not necessarily reflect those of others in the Federal Reserve System. Today, I will argue that monetary policy has been too tight in this recovery, resulting in a slower economic recovery than necessary and low inflation expectations, which directly saps the Fed's ability to respond to a future downturn. I believe we need to understand what led to these results when we evaluate strategies for conducting monetary policy going forward. Congress created the Federal Reserve in 1913 and has assigned it goals that we work hard to achieve. We call these goals our dual mandate of price stability and maximum employment. We have defined price stability as inflation of 2% per year, and maximum employment essentially means that as many Americans who want to work are able to find jobs. Historically, we have assumed that these goals are connected like a seesaw. As the economy gets stronger, businesses hire more workers, and unemployment falls, driving wages up, which eventually leads to inflation. In a downturn, the reverse happens. Firms lay off workers, unemployment rises, and then inflation drops. In the medium term, we hope to keep inflation at the Fed's 2% target, with unemployment as low as possible. That's how it's supposed to work. This year, for the first time, the Federal Reserve is conducting a comprehensive review of the monetary policy strategies we use to achieve our dual mandate. We want to know, do we have the right approach? Might some alternative strategies deliver on our twin goals better over the course of an economic cycle? Senior Federal Reserve officials will gather in Chicago in June to hear from outside experts as part of this assessment. In addition, each of the 12 Federal Reserve banks is hosting its own forum to gather input from a broad range of constituents. The Federal Open Market Committee plans to report its findings to the public in 2020. 
as I think about this assessment, I believe we must first analyze how is our current approach to monetary policy delivered on our dual mandate in this recovery. If there have been any shortcomings, then we should ask, have those shortcomings been caused by limitations of our monetary policy framework or by how we have actually implemented that framework? And then what were the costs of any shortcomings? And finally, as we analyze potential alternative frameworks, we should understand not only how they should perform in theory, but also how likely they will be implemented as intended when actually put to use. These are some of the questions I'm going to be thinking about in our upcoming review, and I now offer some of my own thoughts on some of these questions. So let's start with assessing how has our current framework performed in this recovery? At first glance, it seems like our framework for setting monetary policy has worked well on delivering our dual mandate goals. Inflation is a little short of target, currently running at 1.5% with core inflation, which strips out food and energy, at 1.6%. For the past 10 years, both headline and core inflation have averaged 1.6%, again, somewhat short of our 2% target. Meanwhile, the job market is strong, with monthly job gains averaging 205,000 jobs per month in 2019, and the unemployment rate now stands at 3.6%, a 50-year low. Upon closer inspection, however, I don't think our approach to monetary policy in this recovery has provided as much stimulus as the economy required. With optimal monetary policy, the twin goals of price stability and maximum employment should be in tension. Even though the headline unemployment rate is low, given the continued strong job gains with only modest wage growth, it seems clear to me that we are not yet at maximum employment. With inflation somewhat too low and the job market still showing capacity after 10 years, the only reasonable conclusion I can draw is that monetary policy has been too tight in this recovery. So did this too tight policy arise because of weaknesses of our framework or because of how we implemented that framework? In my view, the answer depends in part on what time period we are talking about. So I will separate the recovery into two distinct periods. The few years after the recession ended, call it the crisis response period of 2010 to 2014, and then the more recent policy normalization period of 2015 to today. So starting with the first period, the Federal Reserve responded very aggressively to the Great Recession, cutting the federal funds rate from 5.25% in September 2007 to 0 to 0.25% in December 2008, hitting what we call the effective lower bound. That exhausted the Fed's traditional monetary policy tool. We lowered rates as much as we could. At that point, the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, innovated on the fly, effectively expanding its monetary policy toolkit by embarking on creative, bold and untested policies of quantitative easing, what we call QE, and forward guidance to try to provide additional monetary stimulus, ultimately expanding the Fed's balance sheet from less than $900 billion in mid-2008 to $4.5 trillion by October 2014. Now, although I am not in favor of rigidly following simple monetary policy rules, I do believe that they can be helpful in assessing whether monetary policy is stimulating or restricting the economy. According to analysis from the Federal Reserve Board, the Great Recession called for the federal funds rate to drop to minus 300 basis points, or minus 3%, on average from 2009 to 2013, using a simple policy rule as a guide. Thus, the effect of lower bound hitting zero was a real constraint on delivering the optimal federal funds rate. So then the committee turned to QE and forward guidance and translating their effects into an equivalent federal funds rate reduction is highly inexact. But the best estimates we have suggest that they provided another roughly 100 basis points or 1% of stimulus. Thus factoring in the effective lower bound, quantitative easing and forward guidance, effectively monetary policy was at roughly minus 100 basis points or minus 1% following the Great Recession, 
when it likely needed to be at minus 3%. Hence, monetary policy was too restrictive in this period. It is clear to me that the Fed's original framework of only utilizing adjustments to the overnight interest rate, or the federal funds rate, was insufficient to deal with the Great Recession. To the committee's great credit, the framework was adjusted and they implemented it in real time. Could the implementation have been better? With the benefit of hindsight, could quantitative easing have been larger or forward guidance provided with a firmer commitment? Perhaps. Hindsight is always clearer. But given the experience we have gained with these tools, we should now analyze how much power they potentially could have if used even more aggressively in the future. I also look forward to assessing how other potential frameworks and tools can deal with the constraints of the effective lower bound. So now let's turn to the more recent period. In the more recent period, the Federal Reserve, the Federal Open Market Committee, began raising the federal funds rate in December 2015, even though core inflation was 1.3% at the time and headline inflation had averaged only 1.5% over the previous five years. It is important to note that in 26. 2016, the FOMC clarified that its 2% inflation target was symmetric as opposed to a hard ceiling, meaning that inflation could deviate modestly above target or below target without causing alarm. With policy having delivered headline inflation 0.5 percentage points below the target over the prior five years, I interpret the symmetry of our target to mean that we should have been equally willing to tolerate inflation of 2.5% for the following five years. The symmetric target is not a so-called makeup strategy that calls for intentionally delivering high inflation, but in my view, its tolerance of some above target inflation reduced the need to pre preemptively raise rates to prevent inflation from climbing above 2%. Yet the committee went on to raise rates a total of nine times through December 2018, during which time inflation was always at or below our target. In my view, these rate increases were not called for by our symmetric framework. So why did the FOMC raise rates? I believe that we misread the labor market, thinking that we were at maximum employment, when in fact millions of Americans still wanted to work, and fearing that if we hit maximum employment, Inflation might suddenly accelerate, and we would then have to raise rates quickly to contain it. In 2015, FOMC participants estimated that unemployment could not go below 5.1% without triggering inflation. Since that time, the unemployment rate has fallen to 3.6%. As a result, 2.4 more million Americans have found work, and inflation is still low. While it was historically a pretty good indicator of labor market tightness, in this recovery, the headline unemployment rate has been giving a faulty signal. Because it counts only people actively looking for work, it literally ignores people who gave up and left the job market because of the financial crisis. Other measures of, labor market, of the labor market indicate that there may still be slack. For example, the percentage of prime working age Americans, those aged 25 to 54, who consider themselves to be in the labor force has nearly recovered to pre-crisis levels, but is still 2.3 million people short of where it was in 2000. Policymakers will never have perfect information on the real economy, but raising rates while inflation was low is an example of a shortcoming of how we implemented our framework rather than a shortcoming of the framework itself. We should consider, we must consider, how our existing framework could have performed if we had utilized its full potential to support the economy. Well, the economy is doing well now, so weren't the costs of this too tight policy small? There are three potential costs, all of which are important. Are important. First, the labor market recovery has been slower than it needed to be. It is hard to know how much slower, but lower interest rates should have led to faster job growth and higher wage growth. Perhaps we'd have achieved maximum employment already if monetary policy had been more accommodative. Second, by raising rates more quickly than, than called for by our symmetric framework, we ran the risk of over-tightening and causing a recession. Markets signaled this risk <clears throat> excuse me, with the steep drop in bond yields and equity prices late last year. The FOMC's quick adjustment 
to pause further hikes was appropriate and thankfully seems to have mitigated this risk for now. The third cost is that inflation expectations today appear to be anchored below our target at around 1.7%. While that might seem like a small miss, it means that in the next downturn, we will have less room to respond because real interest rates, net of inflation, ultimately drive economic activity. With a, with a limit to how low nominal interest rates can go, low inflation expectations directly sap power from our primary policy tool. Once rates hit the effective lower bound again in the future, we will have less power than we plan to have. My two primary takeaways from this experience are first, that markets have watched the FOMC treat our inflation target as a ceiling, never to be crossed. In my view, we have not implemented our current framework as it was designed to be implemented. For our current framework to be effective and credible, we must walk the walk and actually allow inflation to climb modestly above 2% in order to demonstrate that we are serious about symmetry. Second, as a consequence, it is critical to evaluate any new monetary policy framework not only in how it is supposed to work in theory, but also in how it is likely to be implemented in practice when policymakers are facing imperfect information on real economic activity. In our review, it will be easy to say that we will be more aggressive after the next downturn. Make-up strategies such as price-level targets and others offer this attractive feature. But we must honestly ask ourselves, if we felt compelled to raise rates when inflation was below target in this recovery, would we really keep rates low when inflation is above target next time? Count me as skeptical. Thank you. The title of this is Long Lived Economic Growth or Long Live Economic Growth. Again, you know, it's kind of the goal um, of I'm an economist to, to talk about economic growth. Uh, economic growth is what leads to higher incomes, uh, obviously. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the roadmap for today. I'm going to talk about a global and national outlook a little bit. I'm going to talk about the changing nature of expansions. And as well as we can uh, to understand, many of us don't understand um, this couple graphs I'm going to show you. Talk about some recent local trends. And I always get a question, where are we going to go from here? And I want to talk a little bit about headwinds and tailwinds we're facing. In fact, we'll play a little game. I'll put up a topic, and you have to tell me whether you think it's a headwind or a tailwind. So we'll see. A little bit of audience participation. Global outlook. <clears throat> So you've heard a lot of uh, terms today, a lot of uh, jargon. Uh, kind of sucks is an economics term. Um, we define it as not so good, um, so keep that in mind. Um, so what do I mean by it kind of sucks? Well, if you look at the four largest countries in Europe, for example, what you see in their real GDP growth, again, we've gotten rid of inflation here, this is real growth. Um, you know, what you basically see is all of them have begun to turn down. This is Italy, for example. Italy is pretty much negative growth um, in a recession. They haven't really called a recession yet, but for all intents and purposes, Italy is pretty much in a recession. Germany, France, the UK, all have fallen. If you look at the sort of the largest component of GDP, that's consumption growth, you see the same picture except for the UK. The UK has kind of flattened out in terms of consumption growth. I guess they don't give a shit about Brexit at all. Um, <laughs> they're just eating and drinking warm beer. <clears throat> so the US doesn't suck. Both Kathy and Neil have alluded to that. The economy's doing really, really well. And I'll push Neil a little bit more and, and Kathy. Um, but what do I mean by that? So this is, again, a picture of real GDP growth for the United States. The bars are the quarterly growth rate annualized. You can't see some of the numbers, but um, now you can. 3.2%, the latest quarter. Um, the blue line basically shows that we have been on a steady upward trend in terms of year-over-year -year growth. So the US economy has, has been robust um, uh, over the last you know, several years. This is household leverage. So not only are we growing stronger, we're actually a little more secure financially. So if you look at household leverage, it used to be 
1.4 uh, um, times d disposable income, and now it's fallen by about 30%. That is, we're now down here. So households are much less levered. What does this mean to be at a point like num at one? It means that our, li our liabilities are about the same as our disposable income. Earlier, it, we were 40% above in terms of uh, uh, our liabilities, so much safer. Household net worth, this is assets minus liabilities. Households are the richest they've ever been pretty much in recorded history in the United States. What does this number mean? This means it's five times GDP. What's GDP? $20 trillion roughly. This basically says that household net worth in the United States is $100 trillion. That's a lot of zeros. We're very, very rich today compared to what we were um, uh, back in the Great Recession, and we've had a little bit of a turn down last quarter, which, which um, has already been talked about. This is checkable deposits and currencies for non-financial corporations, non-financial business. Back in just before the Great Recession, we were like zero. They were holding very little checkable deposits and currency. Today, again, businesses are a little safer. They're holding a fairly large amount, relatively speaking, over the last 20 or 30 years in terms of their checkable deposits and just currency sitting there. Net worth of non-financial corporations, again, almost as high as it's ever been in the history of uh, the U.S. So again, businesses, households are all, their net worth is high. What does that mean? It means they're going to buy things, etc. cetera. Um, this is monthly employment change. Neil mentioned the labor market was strong. This number is the average over the last 12 months, 218,000 a month we've been averaging. That's a healthy economy. We had a, a couple little downturns, but overall last month, 263,000. Again, a big number. Um, so the labor market is, is, is certainly strong. How strong? So this is a picture of vacancies and unemployment. Vacancies are an all-time high. What do we mean by vacancies? Vacancies are the number of jobs that are listed as open by companies. The red line are the number of vacancies. The blue line is unemployed people. For the first time since we've, we kept this data, um, there are more vacancies almost everywhere than unemployed people. What does that mean? There's one job for each person out there who's looking. If you look back during the Great Recession, for example, in the South, you can see the difference between the red line and the, and the blue line. There were five million unemployed people and one million jobs. So there were five people searching for each job. Today, it's much easier to get a job. What does that mean? Quit rates are also up. What does it mean when quit rates are up? In my view, it's a healthy labor market. Why? Because people quit to get a better job. During the Great Recession, you kiss the boss's ass. <laughs> you don't quit. There are no jobs. So you do everything you can to keep your job. Today, people can quit and move jobs because not many people are looking. That's the point. And again, how that turns into wages, we'll talk more with Neil in, in, a, in a little bit. Neil mentioned that, you know, wages don't seem to be growing. You know, I don't get that. We're going to have to talk about that. Um, so what do I mean? So, the blue line is average hourly earnings in the United States. Going, this goes back to 1995. The red line is inflation. By the way, the Fed does not look really at the CPI. The Fed looks at what's called the PCE, Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index. It's a little broader than, than the CPI. And so this is the percent change from a year ago. Every time the blue line is above the red line, it means your wages are growing in real terms. That is, you can buy more goods. Every time the red line is above the blue line, that means that your real earnings are falling. And so you can see recently, we, ha we have wage growth over 3%, and inflation, as Neil said, one and a half or something percent. Um, what does that mean? It means real earnings are growing by about 2%. So I don't understand the, the argument people make that wages aren't growing. They're not growing for everybody, of course. Um, the lower tail is not growing as fast as the, as the upper part of the distribution, but on average, wages are growing. I'm going to come back to this picture, by the way, when I um, make fun of the Fed. <laughs> so I worked in the Fed for a long time, so I, I can make fun of them. Um, 
So we're in this recovery. It's the, basically the second longest re expansion of all time. By the summer, by June, if it keeps going, it'll be the longest of all time, this recovery. And people ask me, when is it going to end? I didn't, I don't know. You don't, you no one knows. If anybody tells you they know, run away. Don't listen to them. They don't know. It could end tomorrow. It could go on for 10 more years. But here's a really interesting picture from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. This blue line is before World War II. And what this line shows you is the probability of an expansion ending by month. And so here, for example, at 20 months, you can see that before World War II, after 20 months, there was roughly a 5% chance that the recovery would end. Look at today, after World War II. After 120 months, which we're close to, it's still less than 5%. Going back before World War II, after 40 months, you know, it was a 25% chance the recovery was going to end. We've become much better for whatever reason. Economists are really smart now, I don't know. Um, Federal Reserve bankers are really good at maintaining things, I don't know. The answer, we don't know, okay? But we seem to have been able to sustain very, very long recoveries compared to what we did before. So now I wanna talk a little bit about some local trends. So real estate. So the recorder's office in Santa Barbara County has graciously allowed us to use their data almost in real time. So typically I show things like from Zillow, now I'm gonna show you stuff from the recorder's office. So we can basically get this daily, right? At the end of the day, um, we know how many recorded sales there are. So what you can see, the, um, uh, the two bottom lines, this is retail and commercial. Retail and commercial, you just don't get many sales month to month. That's kind of true, we all know that. If you look at the green line, which are condos, condos sales have been rising. Single family residences, pretty flat. So what we've seen in the real estate industry, and by the way, this, this is of last week, I think, or maybe two weeks ago. Um, that's what this looks like. Kind of flattening in the sales, number of sales in real estate in, Santa, uh, in the South County. By the way, this is all for South County um, that we're looking at. This is the median transfer price. So this is the price that, that is recorded by the uh, uh, recorder's office. Uh, we all know what the transfer uh, fee is, and then we can just calculate what the price has to have been. So what do you see? Again, um, this is single family and rentals down here, these two. Those prices haven't really been going, doing very much. However, if you look at agriculture, this is ag up here. Agricultural prices, even though they don't turn over very much, those prices have been going up. Retail, on the other hand, is this blue. It's been falling. So we kind of have seen vacancies on State Street, et cetera, and now we're able to sort of look and see that we have the, this decline in, in, in prices of uh, retail properties. If you look across the, the, our, the South County, um, this is Montecito, of course, you know. Um, not growing. Montecito's kind of fallen a little bit, flattened out. Santa Barbara, the city that's here, it's been, it's been rising slowly, as has Summerlin. Okay, so these are the sort of the trends we're seeing in, uh, from, the recorders, uh, from the recorder's office. And then people say, and I talk to a lot of businesses, they say one of our problems is it's hard to hire here because it's not affordable. It's not affordable to live. So this picture comes from the California Association of Realtors. Um, and what it says is, their measure of affordability is the fraction of the population that can afford the median house. Okay, so that's what this is, the fraction of the population that can afford the median house. This is San Francisco. This is where Kathy lives. <laughs> like 10% of the people can afford the median house in San Francisco. This was Santa Barbara back in 2017, fourth quarter. Of all the counties, we were like the fifth least affordable. What's happened in the last year? We're crazy affordable. <laughs> we, 
we're above the California average in Santa Barbara. So how has that happened? Well, it turns out wages have gone up, as I mentioned already, so people's income have gone up a little bit. And secondly, according to the California Association of Realtors, the average house price fell by about 9 or 10 percent uh, in California. So this is how sort of Santa Barbara ended up um, uh, being, like, I, like you can see here, um, we're more affordable than Ventura. Santa Cruz is down here. And if you really need to buy a big house, move to Kern County. <laughs> so a little bit about some local demographics, some trends, employment, GDP locally. Don't freak out. This is a horrible chart. I admit it, but I gotta, I'm going to walk you through it just because it's, it's very interesting. Number one, population, this goes back to 2005, Population has been growing. So you can see here the population change every year has been positive. So we're seeing positive population growth. The next thing, the number of births. The number of births has been falling. 6,300 and back in 2005 down to 5,500 today. So what that means is fertility rates here are actually falling in Santa Barbara County. Deaths, on the other hand, have been going up. High taxes are killing us. <laughs> the difference between birth and deaths is called a natural increase. The natural increase has been declining. As I said, fertility rates are down, death rates are up. That means the natural increase is, is getting smaller. So our population from the natural increase isn't growing very much. Where has all of the growth come from, mostly? Mostly the growth has come from net migration. Between 2005 and 2007, you can see it was negative. It was out migration. Since 2007, we have seen pretty healthy in migration. Maybe something in pink. We've seen healthy in migration. What that means at the end of the day is that population growth rates are above 1% here in Santa Barbara, but most of it's from, as I said, in migration. More people coming into our county than, than leaving. Okay, so this is kind of an important thing that, um, you know, we have to uh, live with. The second part is, what's happened to our cities? So we've seen some big growth, for example, in Buellton, the one-year growth rate, 3.8 percent, five years, population's grown 8.7 percent in Buellton. The other big one, Santa Maria, over five years, 8%. Solvang, 8.9%. The city of Santa Barbara has been sort of in the middle, 5.6% over five years. We only have one negative, which is in Lompoc. So Lompoc has lost population in the last year, right? And has had very, very slow population growth over the last um, five years. So this is what city growth is looking like. Um, uh, Goleta, again, also kind of high. Um, so that's where sort of most of the growth is coming. Again, a, a horrible graph, but here's what I want to point out from this graph. See, I can make it bigger. Um, so what do I want to point out? I want to point out that if we look at the population change, and I just kind of showed you this, population change, you know, 1%, 1.2, 1.02, 0.92, that's the population growth. What has happened to our housing units? That is the number of houses. The number of housing units, on the other hand, has not grown very much. 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.75. What does that mean? It means higher density in terms of number of people per house. So many people are talking about we need you know, uh, more affordable housing. Well, sometimes affordability means you have to have more people in the house. So housing density has actually gone up. What's happened to our real GDP? Let me, point, let me tell you what this graph is all about. So this graph on the, on the vertical axis gives you the growth rate in real GDP in, our, in Santa Barbara County. Again, that's like income. This is done by industry. So you can see the width of the bars. For example, government 15.8 means that government sector in Santa Barbara County produces 15.8% of the G GDP the income generated in the county. 
Financial activities create 13.7. The height of the bar is the growth rate. The width is the size of the sector in terms of GDP. The height is the growth rate. And what you can see is our largest sectors over the last year, sorry, between 2016 and 17, for the last we have data, these have not grown at all in terms of output. So our largest sectors aren't, aren't increasing the output. Where are we seeing output increases? Education, health services, goods producing, manufacturing, information technologies, et cetera. So that's where it's coming from. This is kind of interesting. I, I, I really wasn't aware of this. This goes back to 1998. So the, the blue bar on the left is 19, December of 1998. And then we, the middle bar is December 2008. And the far right bar is December 2018 by industry. Again, so what you can see is over the last 20-some you know, years, government has not really grown. It's about the same share of employment. Leisure and hospitality has risen a little bit, as has education and health services. Our manufacturing sector over the last 20 has kind of declined. Farm has gone up, and we're observing retail trade falling. Financial activity is down a little bit, too. But pretty remarkably stable. We haven't really switched industries uh, in terms of uh, employment. This is what employment growth looks like but over the last year, January 2018 to 2019. Same idea. The vertical axis gives us the growth rate in that sector. The width of the bar is the share of employment. So again, government's 19% of employment in Santa Barbara, and employment grow, grew about 3%, a little over 3%. Leisure and hospitality grew, education, health services, et cetera, et cetera. What fell? Retail trade, uh, information technologies, wholesale, et cetera. Okay, so these sectors are, 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 are growing in terms of employment. Now, everybody says we want to hire, we need more high-wage employment, high-skill employment. The first thing you have to realize is almost most of employment is low-skill. It's just the way it is in the world. What do I have here? This, the height of these bars is, a, is employment in Santa Barbara County as of 2018 Q1. For example, farm and crop laborers, about 6,000. Retail salesperson, 5,000-something. That's what the height of the bar is. These are the lar largest employer in, uh, sectors with employment. These dots mean annual wages, which are red on this axis over here. These are mean annual wages. What does that say? Look at where most of the employment is. Farm and labor, crop laborers, retail sales, office clerks, cashiers, waiters and waitresses, food prep and serving, et cetera, et cetera. These are all occupations that are making like 25, 30,000. So most of our employment is in low wage. Why is that? There's only one Pete Giordano. And everybody else has to work for him. <laughs> we need more Pete Giordanos, that's the view. But anyway, so don't forget that. Most of the employment we get that comes in are in these sectors, because that's where the highest employment is. Now we'll play this little game, headwind or tailwind. Tariffs. Yeah, yeah. I'm going headwind. I did this last year, so I'm not going to go over it again. Last Monday, we had a new escalation of the tariff war. We decided to increase tariffs uh, from 10% to 25% on 200 billion of, ch of Chinese goods. On Monday, China said, okay, we'll raise tariffs on you guys. Listen, tariff wars make both of us worse off. Both parties are worse off from tariff wars. We're spending more on products because of these tariffs. There's just no doubt about it that we're both losers. This is not a zero-sum game, as many people think trade is. Trade makes both parties better off. Now, why do I say it's a bad thing? The, the minute that China raised tariffs and we got this tariff war, the S&P 500 and the Dow fell 2.4% in one minute. Why? Well, if it was good for us, why would that go down? It goes down because it's bad for our economy. That's a headwind. Fed independence. I'm not sucking up to Neil here. I give a whole lecture on Fed independence. It's 
To me, it's one of the most important things that are out there. Um, and sometimes we have presidents that, that don't treat the Fed very well. Having Fed independence is a tailwind. Okay? Why is that? The Fed does really good things. The, the U.S. dollar is a, is a world currency. It's the reserve currency of the world. Precisely because we've done the right stuff. Now, this is a little bit of a lecture, but this comes from Irving Fisher, very famous guy, economist. Paper money has almost always been a curse on those who produce it. There's something out there called the Fisher equation, which I'm going to show you what it is. The Fisher equation says the nominal interest rate is equal to the real interest rate plus expected inflation. Think about that for a second. What does it mean? It means if you're someone who's going to give someone a loan, you have to decide how much interest rate, to what interest rate to charge. Well, if I want a 3% real return, and I know inflation is going to be 5%, the, the nominal interest rate has to be 8% for me to get a 3% real return. So Fisher is a lot about this, and basically that gives you a link between nominal interest rates and inflation. I'll come back to that. When is the first time that paper money screwed us up? Here's what George Washington said right after the Revolutionary War. A wagon load of money will scarcely purchase a wagon load of provisions. Many of you are too young to remember these. <laughs> these are called continentals. This was the first paper currency in the United States. This says 1789 here. $60. So what happened? We're fighting a war against you know, the Brits. We're fighting them. We don't have any gold back in, in the 1700s. So what did we do? The Continental Congress decided to print up pieces of paper. And what they said when they printed up these pieces of paper is, listen, when we kick their ass, we're going to give you gold. So people took these pieces of paper, and the, the government, the army, uh, and what they did was they took this and they bought provisions. They bought uniforms and guns and food with these pieces of paper from merchants. As George Washington said, by the way, in 1789, these were worthless. And you might hear this saying, not worth a continental. That's an old saying. That's, why, that's where it came from. These things were useless. By the way, you know that musical Hamilton? It came because of this. What happened next was Alexander Hamilton came in, fought Thomas Jefferson about how to fix this. Hamilton basically won, and he's called the father of central banking in the United States. Hamilton basically derived the first central bank in the U.S. or what looked like it. So it first happened in 1789. Governments couldn't control themselves. This is a 50 billion <laughs> dinar note from Yugoslavia not in the 1700s, in 1993. It bought three eggs. <laughs> you think that's bad? It's a hundred trillion dollar note. I told you that the US, the wealth is a hundred trillion. So you could just buy the US wealth with this little bill. <laughs> Governments can't control themselves. So you say to me, dude, this is not Zimbabwe, it's not Yugoslavia, it's not 1789, this is the here and now. This is the U.S. today. Great book. By the way, I'm going to put this up on our website, the slides. All these things in orange are links you can click on. This is a book called Chairman of the Fed by Will, about William McChesney Martin, who you've never heard of. Turns out he was Chairman of the Fed. He was the longest serving Chairman of the Fed. He served under five presidents. It's a really interesting book. Um, here it is. This is the chairman of the Fed, but you can't see it, so what I'm going to do instead, whoops. What does it say? On December 5th, 1965, President Lyndon Johnson was pacing in the office at his ranch in Johnson City, Texas, while he waited for William and Chesney Martin, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, to visit for what Johnson called a trip to the woodshed. Two days before, Martin had led the Fed's Board of Governors to an increase in the Federal Reserve discount rate, the first in more than five years of uninterrupted economic growth. 
through Henry Joe Fowler, his treasury secretary, and Gardner Ackley, his counsel advised Martin not to increase rates. He had growled at Fowler over the telephone, those marble tower boys, Johnson wasn't so smart, he meant ivory tower, but it's okay. Those marble tower boys, Joe, you find a tough guy to head the reserve, if Martin resigns, it won't wreck the country. By the way, this, the actual story is that Johnson grabbed him and threw him up against a wall. That's what actually happened. Their meeting was a classic confrontation. Johnson was a powerful and manipulative president who believed that a Fed tightening would jeopardize the economic expansion and the tax revenues he needed to finance the most important goals, his war on poverty and the Vietnam War. So what was he doing? He was saying to the Fed, don't raise rates, because if you raise rates, the economy is going to slow down. I get less tax revenue. Sound familiar? Fast forward 1969. Arthur Burns, the next chairman of the Fed. Richard Nixon. Oops. Check this out. How Richard Nixon pressured Arthur Burns, evidence from the Nixon tapes. Again, not a genius guy, Nixon. He had a voice-activated tape recorder in his office, and he said a bunch of horrible things. <laughs> One is, he said, don't raise interest rates because I'm going to go up for re-election. And if you raise interest rates and employment goes up, unemployment goes up, I won't get re-elected. He called Arthur, he was a friend of Arthur Burns, the chairman of the Fed. You know what Arthur Burns did? He said, you know what, okay, I won't. I won't raise rates. What happened next? Check this out. This is exactly Arthur Burns and Richard Nixon. What does this graph show? This is the chain type price index. By the way, this is the Fed's 2% target. Hasn't always been a 2% target, by the way. This is inflation. This number, 15%. Inflation hit 15.6%. And you say, oh, wow, that doesn't seem so good. This is a 30-year fixed mortgage. This is 18%. Mortgages, people took out mortgages at 18%. Can you imagine that? No. What happened? What happened is the Fed did not respond as it should have responded. Now, now, I want to go back to that graph I put up before and basically show you something. People say, how come wages are growing so slowly today when back in the 50s and 60s we were growing at 8 10%? I'll tell you why. It's because inflation was growing at 15%. Wages got bit up, of course, but real wages are falling. Remember I told you, if the red is above the blue, your actual wages, your real wages are falling. These were bad times. Today, as I mentioned, real wages are actually rising. Next topic, unfunded pension, li unfunded pension liabilities. Sorry, headwind. So what am I going to do? I'm going to talk a little bit about pensions in California. Pensions are a promise to pay. They're a promise to pay. When you got your pension, it did not say, we're going to invest your pension in risky assets and maybe it's good, maybe it's bad when, you, when, you're, when you're ready to retire. That's not what they said. Pensions say you're going to get, in a defined benefit case, something. How do we value pension liabilities? Good question. As I said, this is debt. This is a promise. It's not risky. It shouldn't be risky. Let's look at portfolios of pension funds. This is California teachers. God bless them. Got an increase in salary, but check this out. 53.7% of their pensions are put in risky assets. They're in equities. Real estate, private equity, hedge funds, only 12.3% in fixed income. That's a risky investment, as many of you know, in, for, in 2008, housing prices fell 40%. You don't want to bank on this. This is California PERF. This isn't PERS. It's complicated. PERF is the, it's big. 
PERS includes judges and politicians, so we've thrown them out. This is PERF, 50% in risky stuff, uh, inequities. This is poor me. This is University of California pension fund. 51% in equities. However, I feel pretty good, 25% in fixed income. Now, what does all this mean? So how should we value these things? I'll tell you how a finance professor would value them. It's not the way that the Government Accounting Standards Board, Standards Board GASB 67, says you should. GASB 67 basically says, if I owe you $100, $100 um, in 10 years, $100,000 in 10 years, I take 50,000 and I say, you know what, I've got 50,000 here, it's going to grow at 7.5%. And by the end of 10 years, because of the doubling, you're going to get your 100,000. And you're going to say to me, how are you going to get 7.5%? Where are you going to get that? It turns out that that's how I can base my, my funding, using GASB 67. Now, some people have written some papers on this. This is not my paper. This basically says the following thing. This is for all of US. So for all of US, it says that if you look at state pensions, local pensions, and the total, what happens is that because of GASB 67, Pension funds say that they're 72.3% funded. That's based on 7.5% return, roughly. If you do it the way a 10-year uh, T-bill would look, would look like, at 2.3 or 2.5%, it says that they're only funded by 48%. Said differently, this number here, this number here, That says that unfunded pension liabilities in the U.S. are $4 trillion, not $1 trillion, as, as we're led to believe. Okay? It's $4 trillion. U.S. GDP is $20 trillion. This is not a small debt. So now let's look at the California PERS, California teachers and UCRP, based on what they can say that they're funded. So what you can see here, that they're, um, it says they're 25% underfunded for CalPERS. $317 billion, that's their liability for, for Cal teachers. Again, about 25% underfunded. And the UC system, um, about 10% underfunded. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the 10-year Treasury to value this thing. Remember, it's supposed to be a promise. A promise would be like what I would get with a U.S. Treasury. That's what it looks like. That's California. Why is this a, a headwind? It's a headwind because somebody has to pay this. When people retire, they've got to pay this $236 billion somehow, not $130. This comes to close to a trillion dollars, by the way. It means either they're going to have to raise taxes, something's going to happen. In Detroit, people ended up getting lower pensions. They took a haircut on their pensions. Cannabis. It's a tailwind, but who cares? You're high, you know. It's like, a, <laughs> who cares if it's a headwind or a tailwind? It's a burgeoning industry. Kathy mentioned it a little bit. There's some issues with the, with the deposit, uh, uh, deposits for, for cannabis, these cash-intensive banks. Is there a big potential out there? Just not cannabis itself, but think of all the other areas where things are going to happen. For example, The Girl Scout industry is going to go crazy. <laughs> All you do is take your Girl Scouts. They're outside of Vons now. Who's going to buy cookies in Va outside of Vons? Go there. I'm sure most of you subscribe to Marijuana Business Daily. <laughs> Marijuana Business Daily basically shows that Santa Barbara County produces about 22% of all the marijuana grown in California. A lot of it in Carpinteria, for example, which some of you have smelled. These are marijuana licenses through California, throughout California. And even though we're growing 22% of it, 
we're not even in the top 10 in terms of licenses for dis distribution, laboratories, micro business, and retail. This is LA, this is Alameda County, even Santa Cruz has more. So look, this is an industry, it's happening, it's there. Um, we seem to be a little bit slow on, on, on some of these licensing. Again, Marijuana Business Daily. These are wages. So if you look at Massachusetts, if you look at a master cultivator, whatever that is, someone good at growing, um, they make 135000 The dispensary managers make 70000 Remember I showed you that graph about retail salespersons in Santa Barbara County? These are making 70000 Here's California. Dispensary operators, 52500 Cultivators, 120000 Good jobs. These are relatively good jobs, obviously. This comes from the state of Colorado. They were a first mover in this. They put taxes on about everything. This is just recently, they're getting $25 million. Since they okayed it in 2014, the state of, Colo of Colorado has collected $1 billion in tax revenue from marijuana. Another tailwind? No. We'd like it to be? It's not. It's a headwind. This is a picture from the Legislative Analyst Office. This shows the fraction of people, um, uh, workers making less than $12.50 an hour by county in California. So what you can see is, on average, 30% in California make at or below $12.50 an hour. 16% in the Bay Area, 38% in Imperial County. So once minimum wages go up, it's going to affect some counties a lot more than others. And again, this is a link. You can go, you can go, you can go there and look. Percent of low-wage workers, where are they? Well, obviously. I just mentioned it before. The percent of total low-wage low workers, of all the low-wage workers, 18% are in sales. 16% in food and prep services. Administrative support, personal care, transportation moving. Something surprising, I think many of you wouldn't have guessed this, but if you think about it, it's kind of okay. These are the fraction of people under 20 who are uh, uh, the percentage of low-wage workers, T less than 10%. 90% of the people making low wages are above 20. And look at these old farts. <laughs> I mean, almost a quarter are making $12.50 an hour or less over age 50. So again, you know, it, this, this distribution's not what we thought it was, at least me. I always thought it was probably young kids, you know, smoking dope and playing video games, and, um, but not so. A better solution? Earned income, earned income tax credit. I highlighted this thing here that you can link to. This is a really nice, she's not here today, I don't think, this is a really nice article and a, a conversation with Laura Capps, who's a big uh, proponent of the earned income tax credit and why it is it works so much better than minimum wages. You can, you can read it. Nonprofit sector, I view that as a tailwind. It's giving to human services, arts, culture, et cetera. These are total contributions to nonprofits in Santa Barbara County. We've now topped $1.5 billion in terms of nonprofits. That little thing at the top here, that's North County. The pur purple South County. Most of the stuff is in, is in South County. That's where most of the companies are registered. But here's the behemoth. This is uh, Direct Relief. So Direct Relief has been growing and growing and growing. And what's happened just recently is we've seen a decline in non-direct relief uh, uh, nonprofits in terms of money going to nonprofits. So that's a little bit of a, I don't know, uh, not so good. Okay, where does this go? As I mentioned, health, uh, human services. So this blue is all human services. It's mostly direct relief. Direct relief does human services, that's what they do. And you can see arts, culture, they're all kind of small, relatively speaking. Okay, some final remarks before we do the panel. Economy continues its strong growth. Are there signs of slowing? Listen, there's always signs of slowing. Any day you can pick out some data that says, oh, look, at retail sales are down, house prices fell, whatever. 
if you take all this stuff together, the economy's doing, doing really, really well. Is there a recession coming? Yes. When? No clue. Um, sorry about that. Um, so it's really nice to know that after 106 years of the Fed in existence, they finally decided to think about what they do. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. I mean, I think a lot that we've done um, in, in the recent past, um, as Neil mentioned, um, it's kind of non-standard, whatever non-standard means, monetary policy. So what do I mean by that? Um, Neil mentioned there should be like a tension between inflation and, and, and employment. Before, when Neil was a little kid, um, the Fed used to believe something called the Phillips curve. The Phillips curve was there's a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And that is, if we're willing to have a little more inflation, we can lower the unemployment rate. And they actually thought it was a tool. Until what happened in the 1970s, what was called stagflation. And all of a sudden, they were shocked that we could have high inflation and high unemployment. So I think you're right in talking about mismeasurement. But why is it you think that the Fed changing interest rates is going to affect the labor market or, or wages in, in, in particular areas? Well, I mean, um, part of it's intuitive, right? I go around and I meet with lots of businesses and they say, oh my gosh, we can't find workers. And I say, well, are you raising wages? Usually they say no. More recently they're saying, <laughs> yeah, we're starting to raise wages a little bit because we need to. So what ends up happening if businesses have to bid up wages to find workers or keep workers, eventually they have to pass those costs on to their customers. So there intuitively needs to be a link between unemployment and wage, wages and ultimately inflation and the prices that we see. Uh, as you said, I mean, that, that relationship seems to have changed. I think it's partly changed because the Fed has been successful and we've established credibility and our independence has been protected by both political parties. So uh, there's no question the economy is changing. But to me, the intuitive link between the labor market and ultimately the prices that we all experience still has to be true. But you seem to look more in the labor market. You, were, you, were, you talked a little bit more about you know, wages not rising. That's where you're seeing some slack in the... Well, wages aren't... So you're right. So Peter showed some data showing that wages are rising now. And they are. I absolutely agree with you. But are they rising at a rate that would imply that we've got high inflation in the future? Not yet. I mean, they're still rising and they're still getting tighter. But the way we think it should work is your wages should roughly equal, your wage growth should roughly equal productivity growth plus the 2% inflation target. Productivity growth has picked up in the last year or so. And right, so by my measure and our measure of wage growth, it's still not high enough to signal that we're going to have high inflation in the future. So as we at the Fed are trying to assess, are we really at maximum employment? Wage growth, for me, is one very important measurement that signals we're getting better, but we're not there yet. And so there's no need. Ultimately, why, why should we raise rates? We should raise rates to prevent a repeat of the 1960s and 1970s, inflation taking off. Well, if wages are growing faster, but still not growing at a rate that's concerning, why tap the brakes in the economy? That's a good point. So I have to do this, I have slides. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I just... I sent him my remarks in advance. He didn't send me his. <laughs> <laughs> I just did these. <laughs> so where Neil's right, this is one of like, the slowest growth expansion we've ever had. It's growing very slowly, no doubt about it. That's GDP, that's employment. Fine. This is the employment to population ratio, something that Neil kind of hinted about, that we're now you know, down to where we were back in the 1980s. So Neil had mentioned that you know, a lot of people maybe want to be working. They're on the sidelines. As economists, we don't know what this number should be. We have no clue. I mean, I think people want it to get higher for some reason. I don't know why people want to work. Um, <laughs> but you know, is that number going to get back to you know, you know, 64, 65? And if it does, our labor market is not supplying enough jobs. If, if we start getting higher uh, labor force participation, for example, um, uh, to get that to go back up. So do, is that where you're also seeing slack, that people I'm, are not? Yeah, a lot of people, when well, the Great Recession was so traumatic that a lot of people gave up and said, you know what, I just can't find a job, I'm out. And a lot of economists, and I did too, thought they're gone forever. They're never going to come back in the job market. And it's terrible for them and it's terrible for their families. As the economy has gotten stronger and wages have slowly picked up, we're seeing people re-enter. That's fantastic news for them and for all of us. 
we don't know how many more are out there. So my basic message is, hey, let's let the economy continue to strengthen and we can draw more people back in. And if we see wages pick up that signals high inflation in the future, we can always raise rates then. Right. So this is just a picture of labor force participation. Um, what's obviously striking, and this is, I think, you know, part of uh, Neil's point, this is, um, this is 55 and over. 55 and over is the only group over the last 10 years, basically, that's increased their labor force participation. If I showed you teenagers, sunk like a stone because they're weed and, <laughs> and playing video games. Anyway, so this is a question for Kathy now. So you mentioned where we are in the cycle. Mm -hmm. So this is a picture of non-performing loans to total loans. Still going down. It's looking mm -hmm. very good. Right. You were talking about declines in deposit rates. I mean, deposits. Mm -hmm. um, Non-performing loans are just pretty much as low as they've ever been. Right. Um, do you feel safer, I mean, do today I than you did in... I think, I think overall uh, there were a lot of lessons learned both by regulators and, and bankers, and I think we are seeing a lot more diversification today than we did in the past. The, the non-performing numbers are, are really quite good across the, across the country. So we're still not, we're not seeing the, the, the large charge-offs. The one big fundamental difference I think today is, I mentioned we have a lot of commercial real estate concentrations. That's very high. It's sort of the bread and butter, what we do out here in the West in particular. But the, uh, the volume of, of acquisition, development, and construction, just the spec type lending, th those percentages are substantially lower than they were uh, sort of leading up to the crisis. So that's the big difference that I think has really kept the, the, the percentages of charge-offs and, and, you know, just overall past dues I down see. considerably. Got it, got mm -hmm. it. And you saw no failures, you said, last year. No failures last year. I mean, we, we, uh, we have a division that does some projections on what we, th sort of what we think, and the, the numbers were low last year. The projection for this year is also very low. Uh, yeah, I think in the past, we uh, sort of a normal uh, number or percentage of, of bank failures. We said, well, you know, if one percent of the banks or one percent or less fail, that's kind of a normal thing. And you typically, you know, when you get outside of a crisis, a, a bank failure would be most likely because of some sort of a fraud fraud issue or some from some scheme that um, that wasn't anticipated. Right, Neil. Anything happened in the Midwest? Failure-wise, I mean. Well, we're seeing uh, in my region, so which is Minnesota, the Dakotas, Montana, part of Michigan, part of Wisconsin. Uh, a lot of banks are exposed to the ag sector. Ag prices have been low for a number of years. Uh, the tariffs are making that more challenging for them. So we do hear from a lot of farm farmers that are under pressure, and a lot of bankers who then loan money to those farmers that they're feeling ex more exposure. Uh, so ag bankruptcies are climbing, um, but at the same time, land prices aren't falling. So, you know, it is hurting the marginal producer. It is hurting the producer that has a little more debt than his or her competitors. But overall, the sector still seems to be pretty robust. But it's been going on for a number of years. Right. And one of the drivers is simply that farmers continue to put up record production. And if you keep putting up record production year after year after year, you're going to drive prices down. Yeah. And that's just the nature of the business. Sure, sure. So speaking of failures, I mean, we met a few years ago. You, you started this uh, when you first started at the Minneapolis Fed. You had this whole program on too big to fail and capital requirements. What's happened with that? Where's that gone? Well, we, uh, you're right. So the first year I was at the Minneapolis Fed, this is building on my work during the financial crisis. Uh, we, did, we took a look at are the biggest banks in America safe now? Have we really addressed too big to fail? And our resounding conclusion is no, we have not addressed it. The biggest banks in America are still a risk. And if they got into trouble, the taxpayers would again be on the hook. So what do we do about it? Our analysis basically said you need to substantially increase the capital requirements of the biggest banks, the biggest dozen or so banks in America. You know, when you go to get a home loan, when I got a loan, uh, the bank made up, my wife and I put 20% down. And that 20% is there to protect the bank in case we, we run into trouble. Well, big banks put down about half that amount on their own investments, which is curious. And in, in fact, uh, I'm sure Kathy can share this data, Small banks in America generally have much more capital than the biggest banks in America. That's the exact opposite of the way it should be. The biggest banks are the ones that present a risk 
to the economy if they were to collapse, yet they are much less sound in their funding than small banks. So we put out this plan, uh, but, you know, elections matter, and the political winds are blowing in a deregulatory direction right now, so there's not a lot of appetite for it, but we're going to keep getting the message out there. And a lot of other analysis has come out following us drawing the same conclusions, that the biggest banks simply need more capital so that they're able to take care of their own risks rather than taxpayers having to step in to take care of them for them. I see. So, you know, you're mentioning there's some reasons why you're seeing some deposits slowing mm -hmm. with fintech and the, these different tech. So how does that affect your overall measurement? Of, I mean, if you're not measuring this stuff properly, are you changing the way you have to think about measuring deposits? Well, in terms of uh, insurance assessments or things like that, I yeah. mean, we, we have a formula for uh, how banks are, are rated in terms of the, the safety and soundness, the overall condition, the, the really the, if, it's a, if it's a one or a two rated bank, then uh, the, the, that's a very favorable bank. So typically it's like your car, you'd pay less insurance. And we, we base our insurance on the amount of deposits an institution has. And so, um, yeah, the proportionally, the, the, uh, the, the insurance assessment could, could be lowered. However, it, it, there's a number of factors that, that are, that are risk-weighted when we look at an institution. So it's not just all based on deposits. Uh, okay. And you mentioned Square. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's coming along? It is. Uh, it's you guys know Square? You know that little thing that you swipe and the little... Right. They decided to become a bank, right? They've, they've applied for deposit insurance, and we've accepted their application, and we're currently processing it currently. So that's public information that's out there uh, on the FDIC's website, so I'm not, I'm not sharing any secrets there. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fintech uh, company, obviously has a niche model, and, and we are in the process of evaluating it against the statutory factors that we we require all banks to, to abide by, or any, any new de novo. Okay. So I want to get back to central banking. Okay. Um, so this is, I don't know if you guys know this thing called the Taylor Rule. So the Taylor Rule was uh, coined by John Taylor at Stanford. And he did not say that this is how the Fed operates, but he said, can we find a very s simple formula that kind of can describe what the Fed looks like they're doing? And so the Taylor Rule basically says, look, if you look over history, the Fed penalizes high inflation by raising rates, and they, when unemployment is too high, they lower rates. And so Taylor had this little tiny formula that I put up there, and, if you, and then you just use that formula to predict what the rate should be, um, and that gives you something called the Taylor Rule. And, you know, so, some, some parts of that are interesting, um, that, you know, basically what's happened is today, um, sorry. So the blue is the implied Taylor rule. What the um, what Taylor would have said, you know, using his formula, what it should have done. And if you see, it's kind of tracked things pretty well. I mean, it kind of goes up and down. This is the 70s again. Inflation was high. You know who this is? This is Paul Volcker, who came in. Um, but now what you can see is the Taylor rule says. According to employment and inflation, the Taylor rule says we should be raising rates, right? So that goes back to sort of traditional monetary policy, which Neil is, I agree with, you know, thinks that we've been too tight. The Taylor rule would say we should be increasing even more today. So you must hear that around the table um, at the FOMC. Well, I think um, we view the, these are the things I mentioned, simple policy rules like this. They're useful in thinking through these issues but the economy is changing in fundamental ways that the simple equation isn't capturing. So I'll give you an example. What interest rate represents neutral that neither stimulates or uh, constrains the economy? Well, in advanced economies all around the world, it looks like that, that neutral rate has been gradually declining over 30 or 40 years. And it, what, what sets it? It's a number of different factors, such as demographics, we think, productivity development or technology development. All these big macro factors come together and end up defining what represents neutral. We don't control it. But as you think about this, so this neutral rate, if I'm right, has been declining for 40 years. We move interest rates up and down around that trend to try to ma you know, manage the outcome of the economy. But we don't set this trend. 
well, the simple Taylor rule doesn't do a good job of including what's happening to this neutral interest rate. So it's something we look at, but fortunately, I think, we don't take it that literally because there are too many other things happening. I mean, right now, so the Fed was raising rates last year. Uh, in December, the Fed raised rates again and signaled that we expected more interest rate increases to come. What ended up happening? The bond market freaked out, the stock market freaked out, corporate executives freaked out. It looked like, oh my gosh, if the Fed stays on this path, we might put the economy in recession. So you. So, we, so the committee then shifted, and I supported that shift. Well, if we had blindly followed the Taylor rule, we would have just blindly f driven off a cliff. So we got to watch, look at these rules with about 10 pounds of salt. Right. Agreed. But a, lot, mm -hmm. but a lot of people say that, you know, like Greenspan kept rates too low for too long. That was like that story that created, you know, uh, there are the lots housing of stories. bubble. And, you know, that's one there of the great things about economists is they can tell lots of stories depending on what day of the week it is. That's true. <laughs> Which day is it again? Today? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, so, cash intensive banking. Mm -hmm. It's a big issue. You go back to DC, I guess, and talk to people back there. Right. Um, right. What are, the, what are the Feds thinking? Do you have a, do you have a sense? Well, I, I, I certainly can't speak for the, the, the Federal Reserve or the OCC, but I know we, none of us really want to be known as the, the pot regulator or somebody that really goes out on a limb. And, uh, and all the, the rules in this area are all promulgated from, uh, from FinCEN to, to Congress. So that's the rulemaking body, and that's the, the three agencies have said, we're going to follow the FinCEN guidance, and as long as banks follow that guidance, then then uh, that's that's our expectation. So, uh, you know, again, a lot of due diligence that's required for the banks to implement that. But we are not the ones making the rule; we're just enforcing the rule. But you see some of these, like the safe, you know, it's called safe, I think, right? This by Colorado senator and someone from Oregon, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, trying to say that you know we have to sign this so that we're not going to punish banks who decide to accept uh, cash-intensive banking. Right, is that right. moving forward? Or? Well, there, so there's a proposal in the House to, to look at this industry and do, do something so that, that the federal and state laws can, can align. And again, we, we have uh, folks in Washington that are more of the people that are dealing with the policy issues, and, and they're looking at all that. But until, until uh, something is finalized and goes through the Senate, I, you know, I just don't know. I don't, I don't have a, a, a good feeling that something's going to happen I see. near term. Okay, okay. Uh, got another graph. This is the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. And as Neil mentioned, it went from, we were a standard 800 billion central bank for many, many years. Um, Neil mentioned something called quantitative easing where they decided to use the balance sheet much, much differently. So what they did, and you can see at the beginning, well, you, you can't see it very well, but so what happened was, you know, back in 2007, 2008, we started to get the, you know, banks were in trouble. Um, they started, that, that orange thing is, or is lending to banks. I don't know if you can see. It's lending to financial institutions, that orange. And then um, at that time, what they said was, you know, we don't want to change the size of our balance sheet. We don't want to change the size of our balance sheet because it's always been 800 billion. And then more and more banks needed help. So lending started to go up. And the Fed, I think, said, who gives a shit about the size of the balance sheet at that time? And now it's $4 trillion. So I, I get a lot of that with stimulus and all kinds of things going on. What are you doing with it now? Well, for the last few years, uh, Janet Yellen, who was our prior chair, started this process. Uh, we communicated a plan to gradually reduce the size of the balance sheet as securities mature. So the Fed, most of the balance sheet at this point are U.S. Treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities from Fannie Mae <coughs> and Freddie Mac. And they, are, you know, they mature like any other bond. And so as they mature, our balance sheet is gradually shrinking. We've now announced a plan that toward the end of this year to conclude that roll-off and you know, have a new, a new balance sheet that's kind of proportional to the economy going forward. So the balance sheet's gonna be bigger than it was before, again, in part because of changes in the financial system and changes in the economy. So these are assets on our balance sheet. There are liabilities on the balance sheet that offset it. Some of the liabilities are currency, so demand for dollars continues to increase all around the world because people still have a lot of confidence in the dollar. Uh, and then there are bank reserves where um, 
big banks especially want to have more reserves to meet their own liquidity requirements. So bank reserves are also much larger than they were before the crisis. So again, this is just, we're shrinking it now, but it's gonna be bigger than it was back in 2006, in part just because the economy, the global economy continues to evolve and our own regulations of banks have continued to evolve. Right, and again, since 2008, you decided to do something new, which is pay interest on, res on reserves. Correct. So now the Fed funds rate it's not, it doesn't play as big a role, I don't think, or does it? Well, it does. I mean, the Fed funds rate is still our primary policy tool, but the way we move the Fed funds rate up and down is through our interest that we're paying on excess reserves. So it's very technical, but it's just a way for the Federal Reserve to control short-term interest rates. Once the committee decides we want to set short-term interest rates here, we use this tool of interest on excess reserves to move short rates up and down to meet our policy goal. Right, right. Um. That seems pretty successful. Yeah, I think it is. I, think I mean, more European style, kind of, a, you know, a channel system, whatever they, uh, whatever cool, they have yeah, there. Yeah, floor system. The floor yeah, system. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's, no, that's right. good. Um, any questions for, for Neil? Well, I mean, we, the last couple of years, we, we've been advising our banks to prepare for those interest rate changes and make sure the balance sheets were appropriately a position to, to absorb whatever impact that, that might have. and, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, I think our banks, many banks took that to heart and they are positioned pretty well. Um, but like you said, higher reserves and, and I think it's, a, it's definitely a much softer landing than I think what the regulators originally pre predicted in this area. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that slowdown has probably been, been helpful. You right. know, one, er one thing that we hear a lot from banks and I'm sure that you do, Kathy, is people like to comment on the yield curve. So the yield curve are the rates that the U.S. government pays on different securities as they borrow money from all of us. They may borrow money for 30 days, they might borrow money for 30 years, and there's an interest rate curve that if you plot all of those different securities out. Typically that yield curve is upward sloping. So if you lend your money to the U.S. government for 10 years, typically you demand a higher interest rate than if you lend to the U.S. government for one year. Now the, the yield curve is really flattened now, and you know, Peter mentioned it's almost impossible to predict recessions, and I agree with him. But the single best indicator that anybody's come up with so far has been an inverted yield curve, where short rates are higher than long rates. And it just signals a bearishness about the future, saying, you know what, uh, I really, I want to put my money somewhere safe for the long term. I'm worried about the future. Long rates end up being low. The Federal Reserve controls short rates by moving these interest on excess reserves with the federal funds rate up and down, but we have much less control over long rates. So right now, the yield curve is very flat. By some measures, the yield curve is roughly inverted, and that's something we hear a lot about from banks that they're nervous about. It also makes banks' business models difficult because they borrow money short in your savings account, and then they turn around and lend it long. So if they're having to borrow money at a higher interest rate than they can lend money, then it becomes very difficult for banks to make profitable loans, and that can be a feedback loop on slowing down the economy. So right. it's something that I hear a lot from banks, and I imagine you do too. We do too, and, and that's, again, what I said as far as banks really positioning their balance sheet in such a way that they're not so uh, out, of, out of match between their, their duration on the asset and the liability side. Yeah. And, and again, for the most part, banks have done a pretty good job of doing that. There are a lot of tools out there where you can manage that that interest rate risk, and that's been extremely helpful. And then just kind of sticking to the basics too, not doing anything too crazy and not betting uh, too far ahead in the future because it is, there are a right. lot of unknowns. Yep. So final question, so if you went back to 2005 and you asked bankers and whatever, do you think we're safe? I think the answer was yes. I think people thought we were pretty safe in 2005, 2006 going mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. If you look at some predictions that people had about disaster scenarios, like you look at Goldman, for example, I saw that they said, you know, there's like a 1% a chance that housing prices will fall by 5%. You know, do you feel safe? To, I mean, are we safe today? Well, I think that you know, I can think of many conversations I had about 2005, 2006 with, with banks, and many of them said, oh, it'll never happen here, or we're sort of isolated. Uh, this particular metro area is so much different than another metro area. And uh, they really kind of stuck their, stuck their head in the sand, and they, didn't, they weren't paying attention to some of the, the metrics. Uh, and are we safe today? 
I would say yes, as long as you're sticking to your policies, you're not making a ton of exceptions, and those are the red flags that we start to see. We and we see we have seen a few of those, but for the most part, you know there are there are lending uh, rules that that banks have to follow in terms of having a, a certain amount of margin on a loan, and we we monitor that. We're not seeing a lot of exceptions there, so I think. For the most part, borrowers and bankers are enforcing that there's some skin in the game. But you know, when it gets competitive and, and you start making exceptions to, to, to keep a deal or keep a relationship, then I know that we're, we're heading down a path uh, similar to where we were in 2005, 2006. And people just at that time said, no, it'll never right. happen here. But it does. It does. It does. Neil, do you think we're feeling safe? I'd say, you know, in 2006, when I first went to Treasury, most of the um, movement in regulation was saying that the U.S. financial system is overregulated. There was a giant movement among economists and professors and policymakers saying, we're losing out to Singapore and London, and we need to relax regulation in the U.S. capital markets. And then, obviously, we had 08. So for me, I think banks are safer than they were in 2005 or 2006. I would argue the biggest banks are not safe enough. Uh, I meet with a lot of small banks, and one thing that every bank I've ever met says is, we're not doing crazy things, but our competitors are. I hear that all the time. And then I point out that all your competitors <laughs> say the same That's thing about, about you. you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, don't, don't sleep too well based on that. The other things are out of our control, but are also important. So, I mean, out of our control as regulators, the tariffs and right. what happens with these trade policies and these trade fights with China, that's a big unknown and a potential big risk for the U.S. economy. I think relatively... Speaking, I think the U.S. economy is in a better position than China, but if this goes, you know, a very bad way, it'd be bad for both countries. Uh, there's still a lot of risk around Europe. What ends up happening with Brexit? What's the future of the Eurozone? I still think there's uncertainty there. There are also risks out there that it's very hard for us to quantify, like cyber risks uh, for government agencies, for the Federal Reserve, for the FDIC, but also for banks. So uh, I would never say that we're safe. I would say that we're paying attention to the things that we're aware of, but there are other things that are out there that we either can't control or are unaware of, and that's what makes that's what should make all of us a little bit nervous. I would I would just add one thing to that too, and that's just the innovation. The there may be a new product that's introduced next week that could completely change uh, a particular industry or something that we've we've yeah. always thought would stay the same. I think you probably all have, all have heard. I mean, Uber runs the biggest uh, car business, and they own no cars. Uh, Airbnb run, uh, operates the most uh, hotel rental type situation, and they don't own any hotels. So what's that next right. disruptor that could change an industry segment that we really haven't anticipated or planned for? And we don't know that. Right. Sure. It's okay. So we're safer. It stopped raining. And uh, <laughs> I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks. You.